Thank you. Thank you. Can, can everybody hear me? Is this, is this uh, working? Okay, great. Um, yeah, sort of a technical deep dive. I guess uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to th throw a whole lot of code at you or anything. Um, I'll try to go into some details. Um, so yeah, my name is Damon Caswell. Um, I'm one of the lead developers for HP's internal uh, developer portal, um, senior lead engineer. Um, and I think I'd like to start by talking about a number. So why am I showing you this? That is a rough estimate of how many objects HP has to ingest for now from one location, one provider. Um, I'd like you all to take a moment to think about how in your environments you would go about trying to ingest 50,000, 75,000, 100,000, 200,000 or more entities from a single source of assets, something, something that where you read it once and you dump it into the catalog. How would you do that? Try, try to think about how you might, do, might accomplish that um, in a sort of large, multifaceted company where you don't necessarily have any direct control over the data sources that you need to make searchable, that you need to, need to ingest into the catalog. Um, yeah, if you're picturing a world where all of your data partners give you a YAML catalog info file that they keep updated for you, yeah, the uh, science fiction fantasy conventions down the street. <laughs> so Backstage is at the core of our developer portal, which we're using for it, primarily for its catalog and relationship capabilities. Our stack includes a lot of technology, some of which you've seen today, um, that uh, you, you're all very likely familiar with, um, and a, a bunch of AWS services as well, which you're probably familiar with, and, you know, Elasticsearch, RDS, Lambdas, Docker, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of things that go into a typical backstage um, uh, de deployment, and we're no different from, you know, any, anyone else on that. Um, now, some of you are probably thinking, HP, the printer company? Some of you are probably even uh, thinking this. <laughs> yeah, we, we still get a lot of jokes about that. But yes, HP makes software. We uh, actually make a lot of software. We've got anything from, you know, printer driver, ooh, what happened there? We've got printer drivers, we've got firmware, we've got um, machine learning, we've got artificial intelligence, uh, we've got obviously software for people's computers. You know, we sell a lot of computer hardware. Um, we've got all these, all these different things. We've got web apps, we've got mobile applications, everything, everything that you can imagine that a modern tech company has. Just because HP is old, it doesn't mean we don't have them. Um, and more. I've got a fun one here for you. This is uh, one of the largest printers in the world. Um, so yes, we are still a printer company. This uh, printer has a doorway. Um, I think more than one, actually. It has a staircase, and it has over a million inkjets that have to be able to operate simultaneously, coordinated by some really specialized software. So, yeah, the software is a big part of even something big and industrial like that. Um, it's also really cool to watch it in operation. Um, watching the, all the paper go chunk, 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 through. Don't, don't stand too close to it. <laughs> it won't care if you get caught up in it. So we want all of these assets, just like anybody else, to be in our catalog. But we're big. You know, HP is big. Um, we've got hundreds of thousands of them. Um, we're actually looking at, a, at millions down the road. Um, we want to make all of those uh, available in our catalog. And we want them and the people who created them searchable, which means finding a way to efficiently ingest 
all of these really large data sources. So this is the problem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this up into two main sections. I'm gonna outline the problem that we're uh, facing, which is really a, a two-part problem, and outline the two-part solution that we found. So ingestion is slow. Um, as our ingestion needs went up, this, the performance went down. Uh, it just it, uh, started uh, getting longer and longer from the time an entity was ingested to the time it was visible in the catalog. Um, when we first started, it was um, very, uh, uh, it was very manageable, but as time progressed um, and we added more and more to it, we just felt like it was, it was bogged down. So, we were new to the platform and we, as people who were new to it and had never looked at it before, we were following best practice guidelines that came from the community um, and uh, duplicating uh, entity providers or actually initially just catalog processors. We joined up before there were entity providers. Um, we, uh, we followed the best practices and guidelines uh, that are available by default in uh, backstage plugins. Uh, we, we parsed locations and emitted them from one catalog processor to, and, and then let another one pick up each location and process the entities in that location. It's a pretty common design pattern. Probably a lot of you have, uh, actually, can I see a show of hands? How many of you are doing that now? Emitting locations and then emitting entities from those locations, yeah? Not that complex yet. Okay. Okay. Well, that's where, that's where we started. <laughs> so, so well, and uh, it uh, it actually worked really well um, uh, until it started getting too big. Um, so, <sighs> problems with catalog processors. They ingest whenever. Um, there's no real scheduling control. You can do things like configure. Uh, the processing, ref I can't remember the parameter name, but the processing refresh rate. Um, we ended up with lots of locations. Uh, lo even locations that didn't actually technically exist were just used to logically separate chunks of data into our, uh, into our catalog. Um, we, you know, entities did eventually show up. It, it, it did work, um, but it took a long time. Um, so we concluded that this sort of design pattern, um, that sort of out of the box design pattern, um, was, was effective if, if you were dealing with a small number of entities. But as soon as you started to try to ramp that up, um, we needed something else. And this was, this was even back before, uh, like I said, before entity providers existed. Uh, when entity providers came our way, um, the, uh, <laughs> we jumped on those because they, they looked like they would solve the problems, but um, they really didn't. I mean, we were thrilled to have a mechanism that was specifically designed to just ingest data. It's, it's a great idea. Um, and just leave your processors in charge of all the post-processing. But our design thinking hadn't really adapted to it yet. Um, and then on top of that, it still brought some problems. Um, if you ingest uh, uh, locations still, you're still getting entities whenever the catalog processor reaches them. Um, if you want to target a very large entity provider or entity, entity source, an asset source, then it actually introduced new problems um, that we had that, uh, um, d that revealed that sort of a, an a default entity provider didn't really scale comfortably to a very large data source. Uh, we still had locations polluting the catalog. We still had entities, you know, taking a long time to show up, sometimes even longer than before. Um, now, I want to say uh, entity providers did offer a lot of uh, great things as well. I mean, if you Oop, oop. I did not mean to go that, uh, that far here yet. Um, they, they offered the mechanism, the first good mechanism for clearing orphans, and that in and of itself was huge. 
um, because data sources change. Assets get removed, assets get added. Um, and if you don't want any old assets uh, lingering in your catalog, especially if that asset is a user who maybe has left your company. You don't want them still appearing in your catalog. And of course, Backstage allows you to ingest users. So this was, a, uh, this, this was part, somewhat of a game changer for us, but we still had problems. So again, the 200,000 number. Um, we, we struggled with this one. Um, a full mutation with, from, with an entity provider with 200,000 entities, it's impossible. You, you can't do it. Um, we ended up breaking data sources up artificially, you know, artificial distinctions between arbitrary categories of data. Everybody okay? <laughs> Um, in order to subdivide it into uh, ingestible chunks and create a separate entity provider for each of those chunks. It was sort of a desperate stopgap mechanism um, at best. It's not really a long-term solution. Um, for one thing, you're not going to necessarily, ha again, have control over all of those data sources. Maybe whatever you're using to subdivide them is whatever arbitrary factor you're, going to, you're using to subdivide them will change. If you have no control over that, you need a different way to ingest um, such a large uh, set. Um, on top of that, we found that when we dumped a very large number of entities into the catalog all at once, the uh, amount of time it took for post-processing and pre-processing um, skyrocketed, because there was just too much all at once in the catalog, and, and so any one entity, you know, if you're, you're the entity at the back of the line, well, you're at the back of the line. So kind of to summarize the issues that we saw with both sort, both sort of default out of the box design patterns for ingestion. Um, so, because neither really you know, fit our needs. We, you know, the catalog processor, it did, it did have some pros as a, as a, uh, for ingestion. Um, you know, simple to implement, mature, you know, one-stop shop for entity ingestion, which is fine, but you know, leaves behind orphans, um, creates long delays in, in entity ingestion. Um, it's really just better for side effects, for, for emitting relations is what we found for that. Um, and you know, it wasn't, it was, everybody is used to the idea that backstage is eventually in sync, not real time. Well, HP kind of wanted to go real time and catalog processors um, haven't gotten us, weren't able to get us there when used for ingestion. Now, you know, entity providers are objectively better. Um, they're strictly dedicated to ingestion. There's, they don't do anything else. Um, there's, they're much more configurable with scheduling. Um, and of course, there's the cleaning up of orphans that we saw. Um, but still, um, can't, emit, you know, can't emit relations from it. Um, there's only two options for ingestion, full and delta. And uh, I think I included that here. Yeah, so the full mutation, um, that's that very large data set. Um, we ran into that JavaScript heap out of memory error. Has anybody else gotten that? Has any, anybody else tried to ingest a large enough data set to see that? No, wow. Okay, well you will. Oh, I see a hand. Hey, I see. <laughs> it's it's nice, to, nice to know our pain is felt by somebody else out there. Yeah, if you, uh, if you ingest a very large amount of data, you'll eventually run into Node.js's own limits on uh, how much you can shove into an array, a sing uh, into a single array, because that's what a full mutation does. You put everything into a single array to be, uh, uh, to be ingested. Um, and you can work around that. You can do things like increase your max heap size, but you're going to run into problems there too eventually. It's a, that's a Band-Aid. Um, think about your asset catalogs. What are they gonna do? They're gonna grow. 
and they're going to grow and grow some more and keep growing and keep growing. <laughs> And they grow because asset sources grow. You add more APIs. You add more data assets. You add new organizations, new, new actual sources of data, um, so entirely new entity types, more Docker images, you, you know, more harbor stuff, more, more charts, more pipelines, more everything. Everything gets, everything grows. Um, I, I, here's another one. I'd like a show of hands on anybody whose asset catalogs are shrinking. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, thought so. So that's gonna cause some problems. You're gonna run into issues where, you know, your backend can't handle it in production. Yeah, that's fun. So yeah, and by the way, you can tell I'm not a graphic designer. That's the <laughs> best uh, image I could grab of a burning database from the interwebs, <laughs> right. So, that's just to start with. There are other issues that make themselves noticeable when you try to scale up into the hundreds of thousands or millions as we plan to eventually. Um, database concurrency issues is one, one of the things we ran into. When you've got that many entities going in at once and you've got, and you're trying to post process at the same time and you've got you know, four or more pods in your Kubernetes, uh, in your Kubernetes environment, all talking to the same database, all trying to get, in the front, get to the front of the row. Hey, I've got an entity to ingest. Hey, I've got an entity to pre-process. Hey, I've got an entity to post-process. Do it, do it, do it, do it. And eventually, you know, Postgres is not, not very happy with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it can be messy um, because Every single entity needs to go through the same processing loops. When we, when we, you know, before we solved this issue, and we, I want to assure you, we did solve it. Um, it could take hours, or in worst case scenarios, the worst we ever saw was days for an, an entity that was just added to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, uh, catalog to actually show up to be to finish its post processing loop and. Uh, actually become searchable. And because, oh, da, ba, da, ba, da, da, ba, where was I? Oh my gosh, I've lost my place. That never happens. <laughs> so, ah, here we are. Uh, so you know, we started asking ourselves, why is that? Why were post, pre and post processors taking so long? Um, we looked, uh, we look, uh, this is uh, you know, stolen from uh, Backstage's own uh, documentation. Thank you, Backstage. Uh, this is a, their, their graph of the processing loop. I, I, I sourced it. It's uh, the URLs at the bottom. Um, what we asked ourselves what specific operations cause a delay in the processor, pre or post. We started measuring exactly which ones uh, took the longest, um, which was not easy, um, but uh, uh, it, we, it was fruitful because we identified um, in every case asynchronous actions in the, in the pre and post processor. You put, uh, you've got an entity that you need to post process. Oh, hey, one of the things you need to do in post processing is grab this additional piece of data from this other source. It's just an HTTP get. It'll only add, you know, 500 milliseconds to that entity and to all 200,000 other entities you're ingesting and processing. Yeah, that, uh, that adds up. Um, we, let's see, the, uh, here it is, here's my calculation. Um, when there's a backlog of 50,000 entities um, and you've got four pods processing uh, entities at the same time, the lag caused by a, a 500 millisecond delay per, per, uh, on average per entity uh, will actually result in a, uh, an additional half an hour just by itself for the entities at the end of that line. Uh, at the end of the, the entities at the end of the queue wait an additional half an hour, and that queue is never ending because it's as soon as you, as soon as the stuff reaches the front of the queue, you've got more stuff at the back of the queue. So, so to summarize, initial ingestion very slow with catalog processors. Entity providers can't really ingest very large data sources, um, and you end up with a catalog polluted with locations. 
and processing asynchronous operations cause a delay. Standard patterns for enabling or for, ent for emitting entities after reading locations are kind of inefficient because of the uh, asynchronous operations. Um, okay, that's enough talking about the problems. Let's talk about the solutions. Part one, incremental entity providers. We created our own type of entity provider. With help from Frontside, thank you, Taras, who uh, some of you probably know. Actually, all of you should know from the, from the backstage community now. You heard him talk earlier. So yeah, Taras rocks. Thank you. Um, with their help, we created something that um, works a little differently. So this type of entity provider takes a large data source and ingests it in bite-sized, configurable chunks with the ability to back off if the data source is generating errors. Anybody run into issues where you're most of the way through an ingestion and then the API you're trying to read from crashes or gives a, an invalid response or something goes wrong and, oop, better start over. Yeah, no, it's this kind of entity provider has a back off mechanism where if an error happens, that is loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, an, if a, an error happens, it can uh, back off and then retry that particular burst of data. Um, and every aspect of how these run is configurable. Um, it uses paging to break a large ingestion up into chunks. Um, you, it pauses between chunks so that you're not, you've, you've got constant pressure instead of spikes of really high pressure on your data sources. Um, and it's uh, real, which is really useful for data sources that rate limit. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're, I'll just say this, uh, we do use GitHub. Um, and GitHub rate limits. Um, so, <laughs> oh, I, I'm seeing a lot of nods and agreements in agreement here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad we're not the only one. I'm glad about that. Um, so, and all aspects of this are configurable. So, uh, you can you configure how often it runs. Uh, uh, you configure how long it's gonna, it's gonna do a burst of ingestion before, uh, before pausing between bursts, um, and how long it rests between full ingestions. If you've got a data source that changes very infrequently, but it's really, really large, you might not want to ingest it more than once a month. Um, and it goes through its thing, ingests, and, uh, and finishes. We also included in this, uh, we needed ways to control uh, when these, uh, these incremental entity providers started and stopped. We needed ways to pause them, reset them if necessary, if there's something wrong. Um, so we cre also created a suite of administrative tools. Uh, they're just basic REST endpoints to call um, when, uh, uh, when, when you want to uh, and manipulate the, perform the uh, activities being performed by these uh, incremental providers. Um, and you can use a, you could use a, a web front end for them or any, uh, any uh, REST style uh, tool. This is, this is a screenshot of Postman. I'm, you know, I'm sure you all know, know what that is. <laughs> so I wanna talk a little bit about the internals on it. Um, create, we create a new schema um, that we add to your uh, database. We don't we don't push it in uh, push this stuff directly into the uh, um, public schema um, in, uh, in in Postgres. Uh, we keep it in we keep it separate. And there are three main tables. Uh, there's the ingestions table, which tracks the status of a running provider. The inge an ingestion marks table, which is essentially a way of tracking the cursor for the page of data that we're on. Um, and there is the ingestion mark entities table. This is, this is how we accomplished 
you know, splitting the difference between Delta and full uh, entity providers, we still needed a way to get rid of orphans and tracking the, uh, tracking the state of the entity um, to, so that we know whether it was still there on that last ingestion or not um, was how we reached the point of being able to wipe out uh, um, orphans in a way that's very similar to the way that a full mutation does with a regular entity provider. Um, there are some requirements for this. Um, the, uh, your data source has to paginate. Um, if you've got a very, very large data source that does not paginate, well, I mean, first off, why do you have a very, very large data source that does not paginate? Um, but if you don't, the, an incremental provider is not going to, uh, to work for that. It, it requires pagination because it needs to be able to track where it was in the, in the process. Um, there's a, there, we're also, because we're adding new tables and one table tracks your entities, um, there are storage considerations. So if you're always riding the edge on how much storage you're using for, uh, for your database in Postgres, um, you're gonna need to up that a little bit if you, if you implement an incremental uh, entity provider. Um, one that did not make it to my uh, slide here, but I should mention, is that it also does not support stateful uh, uh, APIs. So for instance, if you are using something like LDAP um, for your, as your directory uh, provider, something LDAP is a stateful API. Um, and I know that's kind of old school, but a lot of places still do use it. Um, so uh, an incremental entity provider is not going to work for that. And the reason for that is that after it's done doing a chunk of data, it's done ingesting it, um, it's not going to, uh, the, the, the cursor is, that we store is only valid for the client and the session that it opened um, when it uh, communicated with that data source. Um, if you're running uh, in Kubernetes with multiple pods, as we are, we've got four replicas per environment, um, some other replica might pick up the same, uh, the next chunk of data, um, and it doesn't have an open session to uh, LDAP, so you can't use it with a, uh, with a, with a, with a stateful uh, uh, API. Stateless is what most of them use anyways, though, so it's not, it's not a huge deal, but, if, but, if you, if, uh, but it's something to keep in mind depending on what sorts of legacy systems you want to ingest from. So that solved half the problem. Um, that, got, uh, that got us to the point where we could ingest those very large sources of data and do it in small enough chunks that there was never a point where they were just absolutely flooding the catalog. Which leads me to my, the second part of the solution, optimizing the processing loops. It was still taking too long to get from the point of an ingested entity to the point of it uh, being visible in the catalog. Um, we like I mentioned earlier, we identified asynchronous operations. Uh, those, all those HTTP gets that you put in your uh, catalog processors, those are the culprit. And it's a little frustrating because those are also the natural places, the place it feels right to do those. You're trying to emit a relation. Well, grab the data that you need to emit a relation with and emit it. Fine, but it's not efficient at it. So fixing the problem meant committing to something that honestly looked a little ugly at first. Um, Front-loading all asynchronous operations into the entity provider. We banned them from, uh, from catalog processors. We do not use that mechanism at all anymore. <clears throat> Our catalog processors are without asynchronous operations entirely. And um, we moved all of that into the uh, entity providers, these incremental entity providers. It's not a trivial task. It meant that for every entity kind that we deal with, we needed to include all of the methods and functions that are used to get that uh, asynchronous data right there in the entity provider. Um, it had to do it at that stage. 
And that's okay because you're only running that you know, once, in a, once in a while. And ideally, you're never, since you're not ingesting a huge chunk all at once, you're doing it in bite-sized chunks, it never adds a huge amount of data all at once, to, or a huge amount of time all at once to it. But it was, it was work to get it there. Um, every, so every entity provider needed to be rewritten. Um, every catalog processor needed to have them removed. And the ugliest thing of all, every entity schema that we created needed to be updated so that the entity itself could have all of the data that would eventually be used to emit its relations or to emit its side effects, to, to run that emit process. Um, that meant updating a load of schemas with data that was never intended to be there permanently. It's just there for the point of ingestion so that it doesn't have to make an additional asynchronous call um, once it reaches the pre or post processor. Um, and then, honestly, all of our pre and post processors, if that data is still there, after we've emitted the relations and such, we remove it. It doesn't need to stay there. It doesn't need to stay as part of the entity. It's just a, a mechanism for getting it there and front-loading the asynchronous activity so that you don't do that in the processor. It's a little ugly still, but the solution, or the, the solution, uh, the results of the solution speaks for, them, speaks for itself. What you're seeing here is a graph from Grafana of the refresh state table. Um, if you're not familiar with that part of Backstage's internals, the refresh state table tracks the status of each ingested entity, and part of that status is when it's scheduled to be processed. This graph is showing the, a running average of the discrepancy between when an entity is scheduled for processing and when it actually passes through the processing loops. Um, and that's in hours. That's, uh, that's a processing time in hours. 0.57 hours. So we've got, in this, in, for, on this graph, we were down to just a little bit more than half an hour on hundreds of thousands of entities. So uh, that was the amount of time total that it would take for an entity that's at the back of the queue to reach the front and get processed, the uh, total discrepancy uh, from when it was scheduled to be, uh, to be processed and actually got processed. Um, before that, the same graph, we, we have historical data. I'm not going to show it. Uh, we have historical data that shows the same graph from uh, a couple of months ago, and it was, it was different. <laughs> it was uh, four hours or sometimes more. The, like I said earlier, the longest we saw um, was over a day. Um, here's our dev environment. This actually has a, little, a few more refinements that have gone into it. Um, 0 0.25, 0 0.259. That is 15 minutes. 15 minutes from the point the entity entered the uh, catalog or entered the database as an unprocessed entity um, and was scheduled to be processed to the point where it was actually processed, 15 minutes. And they, that graph looks like it's going up a little bit there, but, uh, but I should tell you something. I, using those admin tools I mentioned earlier, I started all of our, uh, I manually started all of our entity providers before running this, this uh, check. So that's with all of our entity providers running. So, in fact, if you look at the queue over, the, over time, July, t July 10th, uh, yeah, I guess I can do include some of that data. 4.67 hours, that was, that was a painful time. That was how long it took back in July, oh my gosh. And we had to tell all of our stakeholders, you're gonna wait an average of that much time when you add a new entity before it actually shows up. To now, average of 20 minutes. On, our, on average, in our, in our production environment, 20 minutes, 92% decrease. <laughs> I thought you might like that. Yeah. And we're not done. I mean, there's still some optimizations to be made. Um, we want processing time to drop further 
Um, the lowest I've seen, is, and I think we can get it down there, I've seen seven minutes. I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen that, that graph that I showed earlier show just seven minutes. I'd like it to stay there. I'd like it to go even lower if possible. I, I don't know if we can get there super consistently, but we're sure going to try. So, to summarize, um, incremental entities, entity providers, you know, more flexible scheduling, uh, more, more resilient, more manageable, able to handle data sources, here's something that's not on this list, due to be open sourced November 1st, yeah, we're going to release it. Um, and reconfigured processors we know with no asynchronous operations. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we learned on this path. We learned that the advice that backstage communi the, the backstage community offers out of the box needs to be updated. It needs to scale the way we manage to scale from the start. We, there was a lot of trial and error. There was a lot of effort involved in getting from where we, where we began with the advice that we, were, that we started with and with the design patterns that we were given out, out of the gate to the point of being able to ingest hundreds of thousands of entities um, without it being a, there being a significant lag without there being anything bogged down. Um, that sort of default advice that people get um, should scale from day one to, to day 700 when you've added all those entities, all those asset sources. Um, and it can. Um, this process might, might have been difficult but it also made me a true believer in Backstage. Backstage can do this. We have the graphs to prove it. We have the active uh, HP-wide implementation to prove it. Backstage is very, very powerful. So this is sort of a, not really a technical uh, piece of information that we learned, more of, a, more of a social piece of information we learned. We need to start talking to, the Backstage community needs to start talking to potential adopters um, not just, you know, what's the easiest way to get from zero to your ingesting, um, but in fact, what's the way to get you from zero to ingesting that's going to work two years from now? The, the same design pattern. Is it going to work two years? Is it going to scale to all of the assets that you're going to add in two years? Um, you know, for some, for, 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 for some companies, uh, like a, uh, of HP's size and scale, um, that, uh, that, that, that change in the way we talk about ingesting and the way we, de with the design patterns that we offer from the start will likely be the difference between uh, them, you know, just having it as a little toy proof of concept that doesn't really scale to what they need to a full-fledged um, enterprise-sized enterprise functional uh, deployment of Backstage. And now I'd like to take some questions if I have some time. I, I talked a lot there. Here. Did, I, did I overshoot? A little bit. A little bit. Oh, no. Okay, tell you what. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, take questions at, at, at the end of the day. Anybody who wants to talk to me about this can come up and ask me about it. So thank you all.